came up with the idea, knowing Bob's history with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, and, and knowing um, that he had written music for the band previously, and the idea was to try and get Bob to write new music for this band that he was a charter member of in 1966, and have a world premiere, a commission, our first commission that we've ever done, and have the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra come out and perform in front of an audience in Columbia, combining that with some educational forums, knowing Bob's predilection about education, knowing the members of the Vanguard predilection towards education. We created this program and we approached Bob, would he do this? Would he be willing to write new music for the, for the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra? Would the jazz orchestra agree to make this the site of the world premiere? And, and that's how the thing was born.
I'm pretty simply, uh, simple harmonically. Uh, I'm interested in voices, and I'm interested in proportions, and being a huge fan of Morton Feldman, I'm interested in duration. How long can I keep something going and not put you to sleep? Uh, in other words, how uh, much can I involve you in my music? And whether you like it or not, you stay for the ride. And that's important, I think. Uh, I don't worry so much about harmony. I'm more concerned with lines and linear activity. And when I started university teaching, um, you get people coming to you with harmony all over. They're harmony bound. So we start doing some uh, uh, Palestrina line work because the line is everything. You know? And without the line, harmony is, harmony, harmony is a color, a coloration device. You know? So rhythm is more important than harmony. Rhythm makes the line move. And in what kind of fashion, you decide. But with uh, a line and rhythm, you're in business. With a line and harmony, you've got some notes stuck in goo. You know, but the rhythm makes it move. When I first heard the Brookmeyer mu uh, music, my ears weren't up to the task. It was way above my head, and I didn't understand it. And after years of playing it, and my ears grew, and, I, and my musicality grew, now I, I love it. Um, because it was such a, a big departure from the, the, the music that we were playing before. So it took me a while. And Bob Brookmeyer has had an influence on every writer uh, in the jazz idiom uh, that came after him. And that's a, that's a big statement. And as a writer, again, he's, um, it's almost impossible to date his compositions. We're going to play some, we'll play things that were written 40 years ago that if I told you they were written last week, you'd say, wow, that's really great. That's some kind of some new stuff that he's working on. Really. So that's, uh, that's what I've learned. There's another, there's always another way to do things, you know. It's, it's, so it does, that kind of realization, especially when you're narrow and most musicians at some point, we all have a narrow focus because we're trying to get better and we're really concentrating on something. So our focus is narrow. Then you hear somebody like him who's got real breath as an artist and you go, wow, <laughs> there's a lot to this, a lot more to this than I thought. You know, so. Well, I usually uh, work with people whose improvisation I like. You know, otherwise, it's no fun. And we're lucky in this band, we have some wonderful improvisers, Oates and Rich Perry. You know and Scott, and uh, McNeely is fantastic. So I'm um, working with uh, some people who are heroes of mine. And if you uh, set up a situation like that, then you're always pleased with the improvisers. If you don't have good improvisers, they shouldn't be improvising. There's something uh, that hasn't caught on yet called uh, firing people. You know, if they, uh, you don't give uh, a saxophone a solo because he's married to your Aunt Grace. You know, if he plays well, he gets the solo. If he doesn't, there's no point because that ruins the piece. And it's not, uh, it's not charity, it's music. And music was always competitive. And we struggled very hard when we came to New York to be as good as we could. And finally tried to do the best that we could. So it's nothing to do with uh, doing a favor. situations with Bob, not only in this band, but and it's the same respect uh, with his band, the New Art Ensemble, or it's the, uh, if, whether he's working with the radio or orchestra or big band, it's the same kind of feeling. He always gives off this uh, thing that he knows we can do it, even though we don't think we can do it. He just has that ability to bring something out of us that is... Uh, not, uh, not in our realm of possibilities, but this is the way we look at it. So. Numbers two, three trombones at 59. Two, three, four, and one.
yeah, it's good. It sounds so much better when you make something out of the note rather than just playing the note. You know, that was F sharp, E, oh, God damn it, is that A, oh, B, God, Jesus, I played that last night. <laughs> and the, the whole point in this, you know, I refer to the old days of studio work when it was the A studio band here in the 50s and 60s in the LA band. You don't know what you're going to do when you get there, but you have to act like you love it. More so in LA than here, because LA the contractors were king, and New York the musicians were king, contractors were scared of us. But you had to go through all it to be a very good hooker. You might have three or four tricks a night, one day, and you had to love everyone because they're going to look at you, and he's not smiling. In LA, your ass is in Las Vegas the next day, you know, really, you know. So uh, it's not being fake, it's just being, you got to, you know, feed yourself and put gas in your Camaro and all that. So uh, it's much the same principle here. You may not really love what you're playing, but it's like you've got to love the girl you're with. You know, dance with who brung you. So the more you do that, the better it's going to sound. That's my only interest. Not in, you know, your mental well-being, but in getting the music to sound. And that's a really a big part of it, as corny as it is. It's true. You know, living proof. Okay, uh, let's have once again uh, the pickup into 58. Trip, pick up first trumpet, one. Two. Teachers tend to teach the things that are e most easily taught, but Bob uh, stays away from those things. He really uh, he nails it on the head, and he can make it rough on the students. But uh, ultimately, they they're playing better at, at the end of the uh, at the end of the day. So just see, to see the way he um, kind of uh, some of these techniques that he's used, it's been an influence on me as a teacher. Three. Four and one, two. Okay, give me the third beat for Mata and listen. And. Okay, this sounds still like a hot jazz band. I want it to sound like a music producing thing. Yeah, okay. And. Better. One more time, please. And. Start with the third beat and go on, and keep that sound. Third beat. More of a story in terms of how I learned, relearned actually recently, uh, Bob's technique for teaching uh, his concept of being able to perform his music was quite unique. Uh, several weeks ago we rehearsed some new music for him. And he basically broke the band down to uh, a wagon with no wheels, where we were feeling, as a group, very apprehensive. That's, those are very strong words to say about an orchestra of this caliber, which in the world as many good orchestras as there, as there are do not, uh, do not compare this. Bob managed to do it through his precision and breadth of knowledge. Break us down and completely rebuild with a different concept, giving us a different concept in mind to in order how to in order to perform his music, which made a very very huge difference. Uh, let's us kind of see into his um, into his mind and his. Uh, his madness <laughs> of, of the music. Pedal and deck. One, two, a two, oh, five. And. <laughs> willy-nilly a pretty good band teacher. I have to be, because when you travel all around as a composer conductor, you have to help the band play your music right, and normally they won't do it. So you have to really help them along, and they have to know that uh, when you tell them something, it will help their playing. And once they know that, then of course, you know, they know that you're on their side and you're there to help. The teaching part of Bob Brookmeyer, from my viewpoint, Bob teaches by example more than directly, especially in my experience. So if you swing it while you're doing it, the metric uh, content is going to be accurate, 
is going to be swinging and the notes will get their right place. You know, people say you play behind the beat or ahead of the beat. It's bullshit. The, uh, the real tempo is right. If you just go D out, da, 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 so da, da, D down, ta, hu, da, D down. Ba do da do da do da ba dum. That's why I think when I'm writing the damn thing. So I do da do da do da do da. So if you go da 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 da, two things bad things happen. We don't get full value of the notes, which means you don't get involved. I know that's boring uh, philosophy, but it's true. And the other thing is you don't give the notes the right value, and it doesn't swing, and it sounds you know like another high school band. So it ain't right. Yeah, I'm a horrible singer, but you can sing a phrase or uh, make a noise or a gesture. If you, uh, I learned when I studied conducting, I learned that it didn't matter how I looked, it mattered how they sounded. So I might look like a complete idiot, and it doesn't matter. As long as I'm getting from them the sound that I want. And I think a lot of conductors do that. They look like utter fools, but uh, they're not models. They're trying to get something from uh, the orchestra that the orchestra doesn't want to yet give up. So you have to reach in, you know, and draw that out. And at the same time, make them uh, know that the goal is worth achieving, so. With this new piece that we're doing, um, we had the one rehearsal, and um, he really pulled the band apart, one piece by piece, and we felt like we were high school students again because he knows what he wants and what sound he wants. He talked about the, how the attack the notes um, and how the air rushes and, and how, to, how to, to make one phrase move into another. And we've been on the scene doing this for a long time. And, it, and of course, I, I know everybody felt like, I felt like, wow, I was taken aback that he was uh, uh, dressing us down and, and were teaching us like, uh, like we were high school students. But at the end of the rehearsal session, we sounded, and then he put it all back together. We sounded 100% better. Saxophones. Trumpets. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, I think we believe it, it's gonna be okay. Okay, let's start at uh, 237 with just tick tick for the moment. Rhythm section with tick tick and band, no, no solo. Two bars, one, two, I want two, three. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the piece you've written for the Vanguard band that we're going to hear tomorrow. Okay. Yes, uh, it's a piece for three, uh, <coughs> it's also a piece for three, I guess. It's for uh, Dick Oates, who is one of the uh, most amazing musicians. I heard him develop from, he was worried he'd be, always be a Charlie Parker after Joe Lovano found his own language and his own way. And Oates has turned out to be a complete terror. He's wonderful. And then uh, Scott Winholt, the trumpet player, who did very good, a piece for him. And then uh, the last piece was for Rich Perry. Very, very good saxophone player. I had a friend of mine, and my oldest friend, in fact, was trying to convert me to Chris Potter. And I taught at New England Conservatory, where uh, the cold thing is king, and I said, I'm starting to uh, sing harmony to the solos, which is not good. <laughs> so I wrote a piece for Rich Perry, because he had his own take on how things should be, which is good. So it's comes to be a sweet, I think about 15 minutes plus 20 minutes, uh -huh. something like that. And it, it will be recorded, I think? Was yeah, we're recording uh, in the fall, and I have, uh, they got some grant money together, so 
I will be busy with them over the summer and uh, I'll be around the band for a while. Uh -huh. well, great, I have something to look forward to.
the things, the best things that, a, that any experience can be for a musician is that you felt that you've learned something. And that this has been consistent. Every, every time that uh, he comes together with the band, there's this great uh, learning process that happens. Whether it's, uh, it's not necessarily an easy process for, for people, you know, especially when, you, when you're younger and you think you have a handle on this thing and then this guy comes and basically explodes your whole scene to, in order to show you how it can go back together. That's, uh, that's, real, that's a real important thing to happen for anybody in their development and at any stage of your development, you know. This, you, you'll hear somebody, like you'll hear Dizzy Gillespie play something and you'll say, oh, man, I don't know what I'm doing. I, it's, it, this is just so, it's mind boggling what he just did, you know. And this happens, you know, so, and Bob is one of those people and Thad Jones that, that can do that for you. It's a rare, uh, it's something that, it's the most precious thing that can happen, you know, between two musicians. You and Mel and Thad Jones really got together in, you know, on one bandstand. And that may have, you know, that, that, that was sort of the spark that may have led to the uh, Thad Jones Mel Lewis band. Yeah, which, once you play with Mel, uh, nothing else is right. You know, there was a great one I played with uh, Al Philly Joe and uh, the Heath guys, everybody, you know. And uh, Mel just had a, a centrality and a global aspect to his playing that he made everything all right, and you couldn't deny it. So Thad liked that, and we did a few jobs with the rhythm section. But all of a sudden, they decided to start a band. We had 13 arrangements, one of mine and 12 of uh, Thad's. Mm -hmm. And we started rehearsing uh, the Christmas season, right before Christmas. And the A&R studio, which was right above Jim and Andy's, which was our church of choice, and unfortunately, around that time, Jim gave out Christmas bottles. And so uh, we'd rehearse maybe midnight to four. So the very first rehearsal, Jimmy Maxwell was one of the, was, pardon me, one of the prime lead trumpet players. And for me, the older generation, he played with Benny Goodman and all that. Uh, he worked a little bit with Mulligans. I had to kind of help him phrase. But uh, that night, I just was, you know, how about we play it that way? And Max threw his horn down and said, I'm tired of trombone players telling me what to do, and stalked out. So that was our lead trumpet player gone. <laughs> and Thad's looking at me, oh, oh that's nice, what next? You know? And uh, it, was, it was a nice band, it was much like Duke Ellington's band. I traveled with Duke a lot, I got hired by Duke, but uh, just being around the band socially, uh, we were a lot like them, I think. You know, just a collection of individuals who loved to play together and still uh, very much with their own people. That first rehearsal was really something that uh, indicated that something big was going to happen. And uh, I, you know, I did follow the band in its early stages very closely, and I, I had the pleasure of really writing about it for the first time, I was then New York editor of Downbeat, and that first rehearsal was in December of uh, 65, and in February of 66 came the first Monday night at the Village Vanguard, and Bob was there, of course, and that was sort of a conspiracy. Uh, there was a disc jockey in New York then named Alan Grant, who uh, also had been introduced to the band in its very earliest incarnation. And uh, Alan uh, say enlisted me and we descended on Max Gordon and Mel, of course, was a great proselytizer as well. So that was what convinced Max, who was a legend, you know, you, you all know who Max, Max Gordon was, I hope, I mean, Max Gordon one of the legendary club owners in the history of jazz. He actually wrote his autobiography, it's called Nights at the Village Vanguard. And uh, uh, Max was ready to experiment. And what happened was that after the second, uh, there were two, the two first nights, uh, two first Mondays were followed by the third. By the third, 
there was a long line in front of the vanguard waiting to get in. It's so word, get in. word spread quickly. And uh, it, it, it just was, was an amazing thing about that man that you could sense even at that very first rehearsal uh, that something special was happening. And uh, I just, uh, I, I hate to, I'm not really quoting myself. I'm just quoting from this early article which was about big bands in New York. And uh, uh, Thad said, it's fantastic. I'm thinking about nothing else but this band. A lot of things had to be done. We had to get men who we felt were compatible musically and personally. So far, it has worked exceptionally well. Everybody has respect for everybody else as musicians and as people. Sometimes I get a little carried away hearing all the spirit coming through the horns. And then Mel said, these are real pros. They want to be here. This is not a fly-by-night thing. And this is a joyful band. We're having a good time on the stand. That's what has been missing on the scene. You give a musician freedom by helping them play well. Uh, that's why we come to this area, is to play the best that we can. And once you can convince them that this is the most important thing we're doing in our life right now, which it is, otherwise we shouldn't be here, then you get the right kind of focus. They say, oh, we really want to do this right. I say, yes. And then uh, it's a matter of detail. Adjusting phrasing, tone, volume, whatever. And uh, if it works, as I said, then they will work gladly with you because you're helping them once again. If there's a helping profession, it should be. You know. And I think what, you, what people heard tonight and what people saw happening, uh, I personally, I've been involved with jazz presentation for 25 years, and I would certainly consider this one of the, you know, the top moments in, in my witnessing of, of wonderful jazz. We have, been, we have been talking with Bob for a long time about writing, writing our next uh, project. And uh, so this is, this is what really has uh, broken the ice. This project is, has, will become the, the birth of our next uh, CD. And so now we'd like to get into it and bring out one of the great, great musicians to come out of this music, or any music, Bob Brookmeyer. Thank you. Uh, this is a uh, pleasure for me. Moscow and I talked about me doing something for the band. And you know how that goes during the winter. I better get to work, but I want to see what the uh, Giants are doing. And, uh, I said, well, pretty, pretty, pretty soon is next week. So I think that uh, John Poses sort of called my bluff and said, uh, here it is, and we will do it then. But this band has been part of my history all my life joining the original band and coming back and helping Mel after Thad left. And it gave me a place to be. And now again, I'm sort of uh, at loose ends and it's a pleasure to come back with the band again. I wrote a suite for three people. And the three of my favorites in the band. The first is Dick Oates. The second is uh, Scott Van Holt. And the third is Rich Perry. And it's called A Suite for Three. <laughs> 